In today's video we're going to master loose watercolours, starting with this light and airy wash of colour before coming in with our ink and applying a little bit of structure, which is all we need to bring this scene to life. Sometimes I know this can seem a little scary, but that's why I'm going to show you this whole video as a three-step process so you can really understand right from the beginning what you're trying to achieve at each step. Everything I'm using, the materials, the reference, the colours, are all listed and linked in the description below. And like that, I think we're pretty much ready to start. But not before I tell you about today's sponsor. And today's video is sponsored by Skillshare. Recently, and in time for the beautiful summer colours that we've got coming around in the UK at the moment, I've been working on getting my loose, sort of layered watercolours, which are what we're doing today in this video. In one of my favourite classes, we look at loose sketching techniques and I give you five different exercises, including one on letting those colours flow, which are really fun ways to just fill up a sketchbook and have a bit of fun and develop your art at the same time. Skillshare is the largest online learning community for creatives and has literally thousands of classes. I of course love you to join me sketching some ink and watercolours, but there's all sorts of creative classes up there, led by industry professionals and passionate teachers ready to share their skills with you. It's a learn by doing approach to teaching, and one of the key features in there is also the community. Under every class you'll find a load of projects, like the projects that I've got from this loose sketching class. Now I'd love you to join me on Skillshare this summer, and if you do, then the first 500 people to click the link down below at the top of my description will get a month free to try out the Skillshare platform and just see what it's about. And now we really are ready to go. So I'm starting off with step one, which is our light and loose wash of colour. And this step will be over before you know it. The problem that people often fall into is when they're trying to master their loose watercolours, not understanding the importance of water. Notice how I've been painting for the last 15 seconds, but not a touch of paint has actually left my brush. I first marked out the approximate shapes of this interesting scene. And don't forget this scene, the reference is linked in the description below so you can join in. But I've marked out the basic shapes of this scene with water. And now I can come in with a couple of colours. First Mars yellow, and then a little bit of magenta just in key places. The next thing that people often fall down on is trying to over match the colours rather than keeping the colours simple and letting the art tell a story. We can spend hours trying to get the exact shade of brick, the exact shade of roof, rather than just trying to get an approximation that both works for the scene but also, more importantly, makes our art fun and lively. So here I'm using so far three colours, the third being a little bit of green gold, and before you know it, I'll also have added a little bit of quinacridone sienna in there. So a total of four colours, that is all we need. The other thing that I'm purposefully doing is painting very wet on wet, and I haven't used any pencil lines. And these colours, some of them will work for the scene. Some of the shapes that they're creating will be great and will be perfect for the scene. And in many other places, I'll have colours which are in the wrong place or are, you know, slightly not quite exactly what the reference shows. And that is the sort of third, possibly the most important bit that people often fall down on when they're trying to get that loose watercolour effect. They see other people's art and think it, it looks amazing, it must be exactly like the reference. But no, it really isn't. The key thing is don't copy the reference, use the reference for inspiration and then choose your shapes, your colours, based on what the art needs, or even with watercolours, just based on what happens in your scene, because watercolours have a mind of their own. We're now on to step two, and step two is probably the longest of the steps. In fact, I'm going to say not just probably, it's definitely the longest of the steps. And it's important here that we're using some waterproof ink. Not absolutely vital, but you'll find the third step much easier if you do, because in the third step, We'll come back with a little bit more colour. And if your colours are going to make your ink run, it just makes things a little bit harder, a little bit more awkward. What I'm trying to do here with the ink is bring some structure to these very loose colours. So I'm starting off with the shapes which the watercolours have made, which make sense. So we've got an obvious shape for the tower, we've got 
an obvious shape for this building on the left. We've also got obvious shapes for a couple of other bits which we'll get to. And by starting there, I can confidently apply an ink edge to those watercolour shapes and my scene will start to emerge. At this stage, it can feel a bit chaotic and scary and you're, you're still thinking, ah, oh, you know, this was a mistake. I've, I've wasted, well, so far, five minutes of my day doing this sketch and I'll, I'll never get that five minutes back. But what we need to do in, in ink sketching and watercolour sketching and when we combine the two is really just focus on trusting that process. If we take our time and we move gradually from step to step and we just build up the shapes, we will get to a point where actually the scene is working. It just takes time. The key here is not to rush ahead, not to think, oh, I've got to immediately finish this scene off, but expect it to take 15, 20, 30 minutes, or even longer if you're really taking your time. The other key is to keep these lines really light. We're going to come back later in this step with some bolder lines, and those bolder lines we can do confidently when we're feeling more confident about our scene. But at the moment, I'm not feeling super confident. I'm just moving around, marking out those initial shapes. If my first ink line is nice and soft, nice and gentle, then I'll be able to come back and correct those lines or edit them in some other way. If it's too hard and bold, then yeah, I, I might maybe not ruin my sketch, but I'll make it more difficult for later. I really enjoyed marking out that little green bush on the left. That's another bit which has really worked well. The shape from the watercolour has worked well for the scene. But then as we move right, these roofs that I'm drawing in now, the buildings going towards the back of this alley, they have no bearing, no resemblance within the watercolours at all. So I'm going to have to just sketch them as if the watercolours weren't there. The other thing you might notice is that I've got the proportions rather wrong, haven't I, from this scene onto my page. And it's not intentional, but it's what happens sometimes when you are basically painting with water. And that means, again, I've got to take my sort of mental eye off the reference and just work out what does the art need. And for me, just extending a couple of roofs into the gap is probably going to do a really good job of filling that gap and creating the scene I want, rather than necessarily the scene that the photographer of this lovely village wanted, or maybe not even photographer, I suppose it's the architect, the, <laughs> the chap who initially, or the chap S who initially uh, designed the, the village. But what I'm trying to say in, in a tongue-in-cheek way is, you know, mistakes happen, also some views aren't perfect, and it's perfectly all right. In fact, it's normally very sensible and the best thing to do to change that scene, which is exactly what I've done here and what I'll continue to do both in this scene and in others. Having worked my way across the scene, I'm going to come back. I've got the bigger shapes, I've got the whole idea in. I'm feeling a little bit more confident. So it's time now to start thinking about the smaller shapes. The smaller shapes, of course, being arches for those windows into the bell tower. There's all these little sort of dots or circles coming down this church, which are nice points of contrast. There's also lots of little shapes, very little shapes and, and textures, which build up to create a bit of tone and value. So underneath all the roofs, you'll notice if you squint, you have these very dark lines. So I can start finding these really dark areas and just blotting them in with a bit of ink. By doing this, we can gradually again move around the scene, little by little, building it up. Here again, if you squint, you'll notice very clearly this right hand side of the tower is much, much darker than the rest. I want to create some of that darkness with some ink by hatching. But it's a very long distance to hatch, isn't it? You know, trying to hatch down the entire of a A4 or letter sized piece of paper is going to go wrong. So instead, I broke up the hatching into distinct areas, keeping all the hatching consistent in weight, line, and so depth of uh, depth of line as well, and in direction. And by doing that, hopefully that hatching just fades into the different distance. It doesn't overtake the image. There's lots of textures we can find as well. And you, you'll notice that those textures look a little bit clunky on their own. And that's partly because I was using a fountain pen and it bled a little more heavily than I expected to. That's the joy of fountain pens. They do things you're not necessarily expecting to happen. It's partly because all my lines are very light, so textural lines suddenly look a little bit too bold. What I'm doing now 
is coming back. And I said earlier, we'd be coming back, making our lines bold when we're more confident. What I'm doing is just pressing harder with my pen. And even with a fine liner, I think this is probably the best thing to do. Just press a little bit harder. Um, and on a piece of paper like this, which has had a little bit of watercolour on it, you'll find your line gets bolder. If that doesn't work, then just use a bolder uh, pen instead of bolder fine liner. You can see as well, I just felt there wasn't quite enough going on. So I wanted a bit more randomness to my line. And that, that's literally what I'm doing with the, the silly squiggles. Um, some people won't like that at all. But for me, it, it adds quite a lot to the character of the sketch. Um, I don't want things to be too strict and straight and just doing silly wobbles and lines I, I really enjoy. By the end, they fade into the distance when you've built up your sketch and especially when we've got step three out of the way with our extra colours. And hopefully you can see, even as we move away from those silly squiggles and we add some more boldness to our confident shapes down in the alleyway, I've almost forgotten about those squiggles. And they, they fade and they create a, a texture and they meld with that kind of watercolour, which in places doesn't make sense at all either. Um, and together, the sort of lack of sense adds up to something just a bit of fun, which makes sense as art instead of as a realistic scene. I'm just gradually now moving from left to right, copying what I did at the beginning of this step. At the beginning, we went from left to right doing the very gentle shapes. Now I'm moving from left to right, restating the important shapes with this bolder line and it isn't any more complicated than that but hopefully you're now seeing that this is where the scene has pretty much taken shape suddenly actually just with this bolder line the bolder line on top of those more textural light lines suddenly the scene actually has a little bit of presence about it which was lacking before and um, if i'd rushed if i'd just gone straight in with the bold line and tried to get here straight away I just have some big, dark, bold, probably a few incorrect lines, and it wouldn't look great because it's the combination of the light and bold lines which matters. And we can only get that combination by spending time doing both. We can't get that combination by rushing ahead, by scribbling, by you know trying to get all that ink down when we're not quite ready for it and when the scene's not quite ready for it. This is also a continued opportunity to look at the scene with a critical eye for value, squint and find those bolder, darker areas. And we can use hatching, we can use blotting in to get that value, especially for the darkest areas. We can really get that value most effectively with ink rather than waiting for our watercolours to come back and try and get that darkness. It's also important not to overdo things too much. So it's about moving around little by little, moving from place to place, perhaps systematically from left to right, or perhaps randomly and just letting that sort of randomness guide you around the page and make sure that you're taking a step back and finding the little gaps and things which you need doing just by virtue of taking your time. Again, these little circles, dots, whatever they are, another point of contrast. I had a squint at the reference and I thought, you know what, actually I think them being much darker adds something. And the same in some of these windows, you know, I just realised these these little windows to the bell tower had been lost. And by taking my time, by squinting, we've, we've gone from our systematic approach to this line work to a little bit more of a higgledy-piggledy, squint, take a step back, look, what what's needed approach. And I think both are great and probably both are needed. So in any one scene, you want to look a bit, do it systematically and then just start trusting your gut a little bit more. Here, I felt a little bit more hatching coming down the side was probably necessary. We talked earlier about how hatching all the way down this sheet of paper is very difficult. So I didn't want to overdo it the first time because I knew it would end up messy and horrible and overworked. So instead, I left it light, knowing that I had time to come back and add more, but also knowing that we can't take anything away. If we've added it in ink or in watercolour, it's there forever. So it's better to leave it too little and come back later. Then keeping moving around as you're nearing the end of this um, segment where we're focusing on those shapes with ink, getting the structure, you might also start thinking about just those tiny little touches of texture which we've missed out. 
adding a couple of bricks here, adding a few little leaf marks and shapes in different places, subtle bits of hatching to fill out spaces on your page which you feel are needed. Again, don't rush and if you're not sure what to do, feel free to take a step away, go make a tea or a coffee and decide when you come back if you really need to add anything else or not. And that's what I did. I was about to draw some extra features and things. I took a step away and I realised it's just not needed. This scene is not about having loads of detail in the ink. This scene is about having that glowing loose watercolour come through. So I moved on to the final step, which is again much shorter than that ink step, and it's our watercolours. And now I'm using thicker watercolours. So this is not quite toothpaste consistency. I still want my watercolours to be nice and clear. And I'm just using that quinacridone sienna, this time with a tiny touch of ultramarine blue. So that is a, a fifth colour that I have snuck in there, of course. I said at the beginning it was only four, but there are there's a fifth colour sneaking its way in there. Ultramarine blue neutralises with oranges, which just takes the edge off that orange and makes it more of a shadowy colour. Then moving around with that orangey brown, that slightly neutralised colour, we can fill in some shadows. The places we've hatched, the, the darker areas where if we squint we see real contrast in the reference. And just gradually moving around, not being heavy handed and allowing the colours to dry and see what they'd look like. And also being varied, so noticing in certain places I'm using more quinacridone, in other places it's more quinacridone and blue. And just letting this variation tell its own little story. Little by little, little touches, not overdoing it, nice and transparent colours, and not trying to leave too many thick, dark marks on the paper. That's not what watercolours are made for. Um, and if that was, you know, I spoke about three common mistakes that people make with watercolours. Well, the other common mistake is just treating them like gouache or acrylic and leaving big, dry brush marks. And they just don't work that well like that. They're just not designed to be used like that. And it's not that you can't use them like that, but often the results aren't as good like that. You know, use gouache if you want thick, bold marks, because it will look better. It will look great, whereas in watercolours often it won't. Coming back here with the same red we used, magenta, from the beginning, just to add a little more warmth and highlight a couple of the roofs. We can see a roof in the distance and just by adding red to that and red to the bell tower roof, it kind of unifies them and it instantly tells our vision that both of these things are the same. You know, although they're not exactly the same in the reference and I've even invented much of that roof in the distance, um, it still just makes things a bit simpler for the viewer. It makes things easier to see. The colours have now dried a little bit so I can see where I can add even more contrast with my very final few touches. And like that, the most important thing is to pop your signature on it. If you've enjoyed this video, please do leave a comment. Let me know how this went for you. Um, and if you enjoy this kind of watercolour first process, and you might also want to join me in one of these videos next as well.